Thank you very much for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I haven't given a talk for ages, so <laughs> you'll have to excuse me. I'm a little nervous uh, before this group especially, because you all know where to find me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of familiar faces out there, and uh, I've worked with a lot of you, so you already have some idea of what I do. but. I have actually had a couple of careers in my life. Um, I worked in uh, scientific instrumentation for 25 years. And um, I kind of fell into that. It's a little bit of a non-traditional career for a chemist, uh, which I had not planned on from the beginning. But then, from the beginning, I hadn't planned on much of anything, as you'll see <laughs> as we go through my career. Um, but it's all worked out very well, and those 25 years uh, ended up with me here for the last uh, eight and a half, nine years at the university as a laboratory manager, and that's been very rewarding too, and I couldn't have done it without the first years of experience. So um, let's see if we can go through this. Okay, <laughs> why I'm a chemist. All right, I got a chemistry set, and that also will tell you how old I am. <laughs> Uh, in sixth grade, and chemistry sets then weren't these wimpy things you get today. You, uh, you got real chemicals, you could blow up things, you could do a whole lot of interesting stuff with a chemistry <laughs> set um, in the 50s. They, uh, you know, the um, safety people have kind of made them less than desirable now, in my opinion. I also had a very, very good high school chemistry teacher um, at Camden High School, which is no longer there. It's a shopping center now in San Jose. I'm not sure what that means. Um, and very inspiring teacher, Mr. Wilson, who then became uh, um, an assistant principal, and then I had a few run-ins with him as well. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <clears throat> I got my BS in chemistry uh, at Berkeley in 1967 and did undergraduate research with Andrew Streitweiser. Went to um, Columbia University the following year in 19, and got an MA. It was supposed to be a PhD, it didn't work out that way. Um, the Berkeley years were the years of the free speech movement, and that could take up an hour of talk just by itself. <laughs> and the Columbia University year, 67 to 68, was the year of the Columbia riots. So it wasn't a real, real rewarding academic atmosphere. Um, I then kind of went to Michigan, and I'll talk a little more about this, but then um, ended up coming back to um, California in 1973 and found a job with Varian in 1974. Left there to come back here to get a PhD with uh, Jim Swinehart. Uh, most of you who you won't, won't know him, he was an inorganic chemist who was very interested in marine chemistry, which I thought was really fun and had a good time doing it. Um, and graduated in 1982 and uh, went back to, to varying instruments until one of the hazards of working in industry, I got laid off in 2002. And on looking for a job, I, this one, this uh, laboratory management job became open. Um, I had an in with that one because I knew a number of the people at the department and so they kind of knew me and so I got the job. <laughs> I will reiterate what Sue said, look at any opportunity at all. You know, just uh, take what you think might be interesting if there's nothing else available, nothing else coming down the line and that can work into other opportunities as you go along. Um, that's why I call mine an accidental career, because I left a PhD program at the University of Michigan, came out here, and the recession of 1973 to 75 was the all, next worst recession to the one we're going through right now. There was an oil crisis then, the price of uh, gasoline quadrupled, which made it real difficult to drive all over the Bay Area going to job interviews. and. You know, and I didn't have the internet either. <laughs> At any rate, I got this job with Varian, and um, I'll go through a little bit of that in a bit because um, I want you to understand both careers. 
Uh, at one point in 1976, um, oh, I was strongly encouraged by Varian Management to return to finish my PhD because uh, they recognized that I was capable of doing a lot of other things in, within the company which required having a PhD. And that, that's kind of like getting a union card stamped. So <laughs> it's true in one way. You know, so there are just certain things you cannot do without a PhD. And so they pushed me over the edge and I, went, I looked around and I found that UC Davis had some very interesting uh, research going on and I talked to a few people up here and they were amenable to my coming back here and so I did and, um, and um, I finished up there. And then I went back to work for Varian and then came here and as I mentioned before, my industry experience was really instrumental in getting the job here. Now I want to talk about what I did at Varian and what I did and what I do, excuse me, here still. <laughs> um, I had quite a few functions at Varian. I worked in manufacturing. My first job was in the uh, column, HPLC columns manufacturing where I was uh, assigned to develop column packing techniques and I actually developed a few that are still used today in packing columns. That was quite a while ago. We were talking 74. Um, I also got involved in technical training um, and in fact the first technical training function I did was while, while I was here as a graduate student I TA'd for a year and then somebody at Varian came to me and said, hey, would you like to do technical training? So what does that involve? It involves going out for a week, traveling around the country, and teaching people how to do the the, use the instruments, teaching them gas chromatography, teaching them HPLC, teaching them data analysis, just a wide variety of things. And I said, well, sure, you know, but uh, am I going to be able to get time off from my job uh, as a graduate student? And, and um, I went and talked to my professor, and probably someone like Claude would not agree to this now, but, <laughs> but what I ended up doing was I would go out for approximately a week every month, month and a half, and earn, earn about twice as much money <laughs> as being a TA. <laughs> so I ended up for the last couple, three years of my graduate career, um, traveling all over the country and then coming back and doing my research because I had no distractions then when I was back doing the research. It was sort of a non-traditional graduate assistantship. Um, and I did a little bit of uh, marketing. I'll talk about that later. And most of my career at Varian was in research and product development. Um, I spent I went, after I got my degree, I went back into technical training full time for about a year and a half and then transferred over to R&D. Now R&D in, in an instrument company is a little different than in a traditional chemical company. Instrument companies are typically fairly small and as a chemist you're kind of a lone ranger. Uh, because you have a lot of other functions, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you interact with a lot of different kinds of people, engineers, software people, customers. And I want to talk about one specific product development I was involved in, solid phase micro extraction, um, because that illustrates a lot of the kinds of things I did while I was on the job at Varian. Okay, first of all, solid phase microextraction. It started with a collaboration between a professor at the University of Waterloo, Janusz Polishin, who had invented the technique, which some of you are, I'm sure, are familiar with. Sue definitely is. <laughs> and um, I went up there a number of times, and he had seen our auto sampler at a PitCon, Pittsburgh conference and wanted to um, see if we could automate the technique. And so I was assigned to that project. I did all the basic research on the automation. I work with engineering people. You work with electrical engineering people and mechanical engineering people because these products, they're not chemicals. They're instruments 
that uh, perform a certain function that is important to a chemist. And so um, you have to work with all kinds of different people and some of them are a lot stranger than even chemists are. Uh, <laughs> software people, you know, customers, what do customers want? You know, if you build a product, that's one of the things in industry, if you build a product and nobody wants it, then you've kind of failed. So you have to be out there talking to customers, you have to be talking to um, marketing people, and yeah, Dilbert does define marketing very well in a lot of ways, but uh, Actually, what marketing, the purpose of marketing, which a lot of people don't understand, especially if you've been in research all your life, is they have two functions. They define products, presumably by talking to customers and other interested groups and also the research people to see what is possible. So they create product definitions. And then they also teach the sales force what those products are good for, because salesmen may or may not understand what a product is good for. So you have to have people intelligent enough in marketing um, to educate the sales force and the customers so they know what a particular product is good for. And I got involved in a lot of this even as an R&D person. See, in an instrument company, you have to fill a whole bunch of roles. So I would go out, I would travel, um, well, for example, it was, it's, it's kind of an extreme, but um, while I was still at UC Davis finishing doing the writing of my thesis, I got a call, my wife answers it, she turns to me and says, you want to go to China? <laughs> and I said, what? <laughs> so, and then two weeks later I was in China, in Shanghai for the first time in my life and doing marketing essentially, tr teaching people over there what the instruments could do and what they were like and so on. So it was, that was one of the real fun things about working in Varian is that it was a highly varied situation and I got to learn an awful lot. Um, I also did, got involved in project management which is basically herding all of these cats. You know, and having weekly meetings, finding out what progress is going on, are you on target to get this product out in a certain time and so on. And in all of this, you have to know your chemistry. You have to know how to interact with all these people and make them understand what the chemical aspects of this product are. So then I came to Davis and I still have variety, actually quite a bit more, <laughs> because I used to work with just, uh, well, in the last 25 years before this, I was working with um, Oh, NMR and HPLC and GC and mass spec for the most part. Now I've got FTIRs, I've got uh, CDs, I've got polarimeters, I've got you know just a wide range of instrumentation, and I've had to learn, relearn in a lot of cases about a lot of this stuff. Um, I'm pretty much a one-man show in the department, <laughs> as most of you know. Um, every time they're looking for me, I'm off doing something else. And, uh, but instrument maintenance is a large part of my job. Instruction on the use of the instruments is a large part of the job. I consult with research groups. A few years ago, I worked with somebody in veterinary, medi uh, veterinary uh, medical school uh, on some um, um, taurines in dogs using tracers, and we had a very nice research project there. Uh, I have to collaborate with our shops in there, and then I manage donations to the department. And those are very important because um, we don't have a whole lot of money, as you know. And people who have looked at the instrumentation that I oversee notice that it is, goes from about 40 years old up to about five years old. <laughs> so um, I've because of my connections with Varian and the industry, I've brought in quite a few instruments over the last eight years, which has been kind of fun. So um, this, is, this is my intimidating slide. <laughs> what do you need to know? Well, <clears throat> you don't need to know all of this right off the bat because it took me a long time to learn all of this, and this is everything that I, a lot of this I picked up while working at Varian. Um, I came out of, of, with a PhD with strong chemical knowledge, especially in certain areas, 
a lot of the mechanical, electronics, uh, computer operating systems, hardware, networking software I picked up at Varian simply by talking with people and, and just using it and delving down into the systems and learning all the time. That's, that's one of the fun things about this job is uh, well, there's always something new to learn. And instrumentation experience with a wide variety of instrumentation um, pretty much allows me to do the job I'm doing today on a day-to-day -day basis without really stressing out a lot of people. One of the things I, I, I tell people, uh, because I oversee courses um, as part of the job, the physical chemistry and the analytical chemistry courses and so on, one of the keys to doing this job is to make sure the faculty never get upset. You know, because an instrument has failed or something else isn't working or whatever. That's, that's just basic lab management of the course um, labs. So then there's the soft skills. I was asked to talk about that too. And that applies to any job. These all do. Most important skills is understanding the requirements of the customer. And of course, you're all my customers, <laughs> most of you. The PI the course instructor, the students, and your management. I only have one manager, and he leaves me alone most of the time. So. <laughs> you have to do budgeting. You have to do or you be organized. I'm not as organized as I'd like to be, but you do have to be organized. Communications are extremely important, both, both ways. So you understand what people need and what they um, and and that they understand what you need out of them as well, especially in terms of use of instruments and things like that. And then public service. Um, I'm not gonna tell you the parts of public service I do that aren't uh, ACS oriented, but uh, this is my experience with ACS. Uh, I joined ACS in 1966, five more years and it's free. Um, <laughs> I know, I know, I'm going gray. Uh, <clears throat> I subscribed to the several journals, uh, actually a couple of others, but for many years, because you know when I uh, got my BS, um, you, did, you didn't have the internet, you had to have paper copies, you had to uh, look through, I'm, I'm so jealous of you. You know, you can just look these things up online. Um, and I use that now as well. Uh, CNE News has been a great tool ever since then. Um, I had a conversation with Katie Hunt, who was the, I think, ACS president-elect at the time in 1966, uh, 2005, and uh, I, was, I was basically bitching about what ACS did for the common person, especially industrial people who got laid off and things like that, and she said, well, why don't you get involved? <laughs> and so I did. I, was elected counselor for the Sacramento section in 2007 and re-elected and now a member um, as of last year of the Committee on Economic and Professional Activities, that's SEPA, and a member of the SEPA subcommittee on public policy and the public policy people are the ones who actually interact with the um, Congress and the legislators and things like that. So I've just started getting involved in that and then just uh, last week, I was informed that I am now a liaison to the Graduate Education uh, Advisory Group, whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I do know graduate education. So I, I will uh, be looking forward to getting involved in that. And these are activities that, that we do at the national meetings as a counselor. I, I go to the council meeting, which is you know, like about um, four to eight hours on Wednesday morning of the national meeting. But on top of that, all this other stuff has added up to another, um, oh, 16 to 20 hours of meetings while I'm at the national meeting. So I don't get to go look at nice research papers, but that's okay. This is a part of uh, a time in my career when I'm ready for this kind of thing, whereas I might not have been much earlier in my career. So I think, that's it.